2020, when the world began to end. I was on a plane from Atlanta to Toronto, and the flight attendants gave us all blotter paper. They said it would make us immune to COVID-19. It tasted bitter and made me sleepy. I remember the voice from the radio clearly. It is unknown. It is the unknown name for God and God itself which dissuades us from thinking itself. The voice said. I was confused. The voice talked about how the disaster had come. With respect to the disaster, one dies too late. But this does not dissuade us from dying. It said. Because it is always taking place after having taken place. There cannot be any experience of it. I remember feeling so tired. The most tired I'd ever felt. The disaster, that which does not have the ultimate or equivalent, it bears the ultimate away in the disaster. I just couldn't keep awake. The disaster is the ultimate experience and that group of us and probably should all experience. I fell asleep and began to dream. What a vivid dream I had. It still is the most vivid dream I've ever had. I found myself climbing a mountain. Near the top, a man who called himself Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel greeted me. He wore this long robe that covered his whole body and told me that the world was going to end soon, but that I could survive death. I asked him how. He told me that consciousness persists after death, and if I became aware of it, my ego would carry on in its new body. I asked him what he meant. He said that once, when we are about to die, if we close our eyes and focus on the actuality of our pure consciousness, on the movements in which we are conscious, then when we are reincarnated, 
we will still have our past memories. I asked if reincarnation was real. He replied that when we are about to die, we feel like we want to go to sleep and be carried away by a white light, but that when we are dying, we must resist every urge to go to sleep. For if we remain focused in thinking about our consciousness, we will survive the death of our ego and find ourselves awake in a new body. I asked what I was supposed to do with this knowledge. He said to find one of his pupil's nephews in Paris. I asked who the nephew was. He said it was Maurice Blanchot's nephew, and like that, I woke up on the streets of Paris. I saw a mime performing sections of the phenomenology outside a church. He mimed the following. True spirit is the unity of the absolutely separate moments, and indeed, it is through the free actuality of these egoless extremes that it achieves its concrete existence. A man who looked like a mixture of contradictory things, with a face that resembled a fox, a body as slender as a lizard, and hands twice the size of mine approached me. He sang in a falsetto voice, until turning to a mocking bass. Oh, you want to hear what he said to me? I think I have a recording of it. Let me play it. It was so long ago. Are you Blanchot's nephew? I said. Suddenly his voice turned feminine. I am angry about being mediocre. Yes, yes, I admit it, I am mediocre, but I'm angry about it. I'm sorry. I'm looking for Blancho's nephew. Can you help me? I am him. I am him. Hego appeared in a dream and told me to seek you. I compose harpsichord pieces that nobody plays. I'm sorry. Amazing! <laughs> Pretty good, I'd say. But it sounds much the same as everyone else. Everyone else? I'm not brave enough for art. And besides, why give up on happiness when there's no guarantee of success? So why play these poetry little games? Poetry? It's what everyone does in my position. I'm doing exactly what everyone else goes around doing. I didn't make the rules, and it would be bizarre not to abide by them. What do you mean? Are you being ironic or are you telling the truth? Quite. Everything would be fine if it weren't for a certain number of people who get called hard-working. Those people. They're always at work, doing their job from morning to night, and not doing anything else. Quite tragic, huh? They're always rushing around. Who? The hard-working people. Don't you believe it? They're constantly exhausted. How else will they survive? You believe. Happiness is made the same for everyone. What a strange vision. I looked at him as if he was a madman. He led me into the sewers, and then, after a few moments of silence, he said, What's the matter? Are you feeling ill? A bit, but it'll pass. You have the worried air of a man tormented by some distressing idea. Yeah, uh, the world is gonna end. We are done for. Done for how? The sewer led us into some ruins. Done for, I tell you, there's no way out. What shall we do? Do? Go out in public, pretend not to have a care in the world, and behave as if nothing was wrong. The tribunal works in secret, but at least it's slow. We must make use of this time. We walked in quiet in the ruins. Then for a moment, he thought he lost me. He looked around and asked, Where are you? I have lost my friend. I was beside him and confused that he thought he lost me. I am here. You look troubled to me. That's because I am. The ruins lead us into an abandoned castle. 
So what would you advise me to do then? Change the subject. And so I began my travels to another land. There, as the pandemic grew, I tried to make sense of my encounter with Blanchot's nephew. His words had infected me, heightening my madness. It was such a tumultuous time then. Blanchot's nephew had some sort of disrupted consciousness, speaking in contradictions and of the perversion of everything. He felt lonely, but wanted to seem self-sufficient, as if he needed me, but didn't want to acknowledge how much he needed me. I wonder if madness was the symptom of the panic, or if it was simply the only possible response. We know better now. It was true that, in those times, what was true was contradictory, that what seemed good at first quickly turned bad. We know now that there is no going back to a time when we could just be plain minds enjoying life as animals. All of society had become disrupted, we were all self-isolated from each other, and we tried to fend off the madness, thinking things could run smoothly without a foundation. But everything fell into contradiction and collapse. Why not revel in it? During that time, there was no more actuality, no outside. Outside. We could not go outside anymore. Then we were on the outside, the outer side, not without but with outness itself, out of breath, breathless, out with breath. Hear me breathe. No, only words. Breath, breath between the words, breaths between the word worlds, but those are gone. It's all words, play with words, word play, word worlds being made, witty, wit, who speaks, bridges. Make bridges between our own little islands. Yet the existence of the island implies something outside, some other land. Are you land, an other voice, who hears me? The ears, they're the only part of the body we can't shut down. Everything was being shut down, but not the ears. We could never shut down the ears. We could block ears, but never shut them down. Why? We could shut our eyes go to sleep for hours on end, hoping it would stop, shut our borders, shut everything. We shut down everything, but we were still condemned to hear, hear the disaster. I tried to watch silent films to escape, but eventually I needed to go outside to buy groceries, and then sound returned. I tried to flee, I tried to disguise myself in wit, but the voice of the other always returned. It turned, returned turning and turning in a widening gyre. The center could not hold, but the ears kept our balance. The voice of the other kept us grounded from that absolute disruption. Yet we still continued to hear, even as we spoke. I had no option but to speak. At first my language was simple, and as I grew up I learned to flatter others, but as the world began to end it turned evasive. We all began to be more evasive. I avoided other people until finally my speech became mad. Mad speech. Mad songs of thirty arias that could not shut down our hearing. 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 A hearing. The trial. Like a dog. That was the last time I saw a crowd. After that, two burly nurses came to my house. Ode otne evle aurie aus hay, one said. I'm sorry, I didn't get that, I said. Then, a small man jumped out of one of the nurse's fanny packs and started to speak in English. The hearing! The hearing! said the small man. He was half my size and had well-kempt eyebrows and oversized hands. I am confused, I said. You have been quarantined. From here in out, you must never leave your house, said the small man. He hit me with a broom. And like that, I was stuck in my room. As the days went on, I became more and more sick. My fever became worse, my throat more sore. I enjoyed the times I was asleep more than the times I was awake. I had vivid dreams of my homeland. 
I had not been there since I was born. I had spent my life surrounded by Western ideas that were the cause of the Great Collapse. Yet I heard about my homeland from every television in the world. Every day I waited to dream once more, to be born once more. Could I hear you from my dreams? Yes, I found history in my dreams. History is hysterical. In order to look at it, we must be excluded from it. My dreams, the origin of the disaster, of this hysteria, of this disruption. The virus negated everything, but it needed a something before it. It needed a history, a place of origin, my place of origin. History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Yes, here in my dreams, I found the greatest refuge from the disruption. Though things got worse and worse, though I was hooked up into a machine, and though my lungs started to collapse, I spend my times dreaming still. Still dreams, dreams of a still land. Hear them speak a foreign language. I knew things would be over when I felt like drifting off into a sleep which would give me eternal rest. Then, suddenly, I remembered Hegel's advice, and something inside pushed me outward. And so I focused on my consciousness, resisting every urge to give in to that white light. I focused, and images of homeland came into my focus. And I focused and heard my history calling me. And I focused, and I found I did not die. For every time I did die, I carried on. And so I spent centuries living, meeting people, but always dying. I would never get to die of natural causes. Every life I lived was interrupted by some disaster. The first time I reincarnated, I was a philosopher in Germany whose village was being attacked by Napoleon. I fled to China and hid in a village there. I fell in love and had children, living in peace until one day our village was set fire. I remember my second death distinctly. I remember the look in my wife's eyes and how I used the last of my strength to bring her out of our burning house. The world is gone. I must carry you. I remember throwing her out the door before it collapsed on me. My last act of madness. A more fou. And I remember after that, too. I remember waking up as a soldier in Europe in the trenches. Always returning to Europe, I could not escape its history. No one could. I remember fighting for months on end before chlorine gas choked me. And after that, I remember being a revolutionary in France, talking about pamphlets all day until a guillotine cut my head off. And after that, I... There was always another story. I could go on and on, but the point is, no matter what, my life was always cut short. Tired of dealing with a repeated disaster, I decided to isolate myself in a mountain. Where was history now? How could I exist without a past, without a birth? I did not know. I still do not know. All I know is that the world is gone, and I am alone, biding my time in self-isolation, existing until... until... <laughs>